Hi, everybody. This is Erica Mello, and welcome to episode number 153 of Tough to Treat. And this is a re-release of an episode that Susan and I did on hypermobility and low back pain. And we recorded this originally in 2018. And... Uh, for those of you who are new to our podcast, I would urge you to go back and, and you know, wherever you listen to uh, to podcasts and go back to our the, our feed earlier on because uh, we have, uh, you know, we've run the gamut of cases over the years in terms of, uh, you know, diagnosis, region of the body, and they all are so different. It's like our patient population, right? No one ever presents really the same. And I would say that of our podcast, they're all very different. Even if we talk about a similar theme, we all we come up with a different viewpoint on the patient's problem. So in this particular episode, it is a patient of mine who is, was a spin instructor uh, here in New York City who had low back pain. And not only was she a spin instructor, she loved to do yoga. And why is it always that people who are hypermobile love to do, love to stretch? It's crazy. Um, and she loved, and, and she loved that. And it wasn't really helping. And so we talk a lot about uh, how I found her drivers. And with people who are hypermobile, they'll often pre present with various regions of the body that are bothering them. And it may be that they have more than one driver, and that is very common. Uh, but I include myself in this body type. I am super flexible and we can compensate, I would say, a little bit more than your average non-hypermobile person and until we cannot compensate, until we run out of options. So there may be that that worry of, you know, I'm I'm you know, you're gonna look at various regions of the body. But that's not the case. So you will find one or two driving regions that are causing your patient's symptoms. And I, I wanted you to, you know, to think about, uh, think about with these patients, or oh, all, all patients actually, what is the impairment? Yes, this person obviously has a loss of control, but is that the only impairment? Is there a dominant movement pattern? Is there a gripping strategy underlying this hypermobility? And more often than not, there is. So join us as Susan and I discuss the assessment through to exercise prescription. And a lot of times, depending on the level of hypermobility, you, our, the nervous, our nervous systems need input and load at some point. And I have found, at least in my clinical practice, that sometimes not overloading the patient, but adding a little bit more of a, a load stimulus to some of these hypermobile patients at the beginning, it, it, in the realm that they can control, of course, may be worthwhile at the beginning. And that is different for every patient. So we hope you enjoy the episode. Hey, everybody, this is Susan Clinton and Erica Mello, and welcome to podcast, gosh, I think it's 34, maybe? Um, I'm losing track, but uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you, Susan? I'm good, Erica. How are you? I'm good. Good, good, good. Okay, this patient is a really interesting one. I always say they're interesting, and I know I do, but I treat a lot of hypermobile patients, which I know you do as well, and I think mm -hmm. for me, they're, they're somewhat tough to treat you know, pardon, you know, the, the pun, but they are tough to treat, I find. So this patient is 24 years old. It's female. She initially came to see me back in August for left foot pain. She's a fitness instructor here in New York City. And so she didn't come in consistently at the beginning, <clears throat> to be honest, for, it was for, for her foot. So I took a look at her briefly after some classes and ultimately ended up doing some taping to her foot. I didn't see her officially in the office, just, just, you know, one or two visits. So that got better. She returned to see me in September, like a month later, for some low back pain she'd been having pretty consistently. She is also short. She's not very tall. I mean, she, no, she's not, I mean, she's probably like five, five foot, maybe five foot one. Mm -hmm. And she had had prior physical therapy 
and she had steroid and I don't think she had injections. I think she took the oral, the oral steroids. They did not help at all. And she was saying that stretching, I'm like, oh no, don't tell me stretching helps you. You're hypermobile. <laughs> stretching her hip flexors makes her feel better. She was getting some medical massage as well. The woman was probably working on psoas, doing some psoas release. She also loved yoga. And I'm like, why do people who are hypermobile always do yoga? And, you know, and her big issue with the yoga is that she couldn't do a lot of the twisting without kicking in her low back pain. Her back pain was bi pretty much bilateral, but it would switch one day. It'd be the right. The next day it would be the left. So when, I don't know what you think, Susan, but when I see patients saying, then it's the right, now it's the left. There's there's some level of a control problem there, like a hypermobile. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you agree? When it's constantly changing like that? Yeah, when when I when I hear those stories, I kind of think that um, what we have is a system that's pretty transient, and so one direction may work one day, and another direction may not work as much the other day. And I'm not so really sure that it's like the joint slipping in and out of place. But I agree with you. I kind of think more of a this is maybe you know a little bit closer to more if you want to uh, think about it that way less of a global problem and more of a segmental kind of uh, control issue like motor control. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I find it interesting too that I think people gravitate to the exercises that they feel like they can accomplish easy. And so a lot of people who have what quote hypermobility syndrome, if you want to you know, put it that way in those kinds of terms, um, often gravitate to sports and activities in which you know, they, 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 they feel like that they can accomplish well. And so I think the reason that they go to yoga is because they can move well. I mean, they, they actually have, they're flexible. A lot of people who are stiff tend not to go to yoga, which would be actually good for them yep. um, to get them moving in different ways that, you know, but it's not so much that I worry about them going to yoga. It's, it's, again, it sounds to me like with rotation, it kicks in her back, her back pain. So to me, it's kind of like, Ooh, maybe you need a little bit more time and input on how to control some of those movements a little bit better um, so that they're working and doing the yoga without trying to bring their, you know, staying out of symptoms, you know, yeah. kind of as well too. So what'd you find? So what I ended up doing with her, the main issue, she couldn't sleep at night. I mean, mm. th in the morning was worse. Um, sitting was kind of aggravating. And, you know, ultimately the fitness instruction she does with Bartleheim is spinning, a spin instructor as well. So you know, when you're sitting bothers you and you're sitting on a bike for a period of time, that's kind of tough. And I think it was more the transition from, you know, off the bike, onto the bike, off, on, that, you know, up, down, sit, stand mm -hmm. on a bike. Um, so just, but no other, no other past medical history, no other med, med, um, medications, et cetera, no imaging. So nothing of relevance there in, in terms of any red flags. She's 24. So what I ended up, I took a just quick look at her. She's like obviously in sort of an interior pelvic tilt with that, with that lordosis, that, that classic sort of dancer posture, which is what she did as a child. So one thing to note here, and it'll come into play when I tell you some objective findings I had, she was taught when she was dancing, I don't even know if with the type of, I don't think it was classical ballet, I think it was more like hip hop and things like that. She was taught to disassociate her thorax from her low back and her pelvis by shearing one to the right, mm -hmm. one to the left. So, you know, literally keeping her lumbar and her pelvis stationary and shearing the thorax over the top of the pelvis. And she did that very often. Mm -hmm. So I think she created some form of a hypermobility. In standing, I noticed like a, a, a hinge, like at L1, L2. Mm -hmm. And she also complained occasionally of bilateral quad pain. Just like a, like a, like a, she called it a stiffness, but it, she wasn't stiff. It was just, it, it, and it well, probably wasn't pain. It was just more of like, like a weird feeling. She, 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 she told me. So, I ended up, I said, let me see how you move. And I just, I looked at her standing and she had your typical issues and her center of mass was actually pretty okay. She had some issues with her hip where her, where her, she was in this pelvic rotation to the left. She had her upper body was sort of rot out rotated to the right. It's not unusual for someone who's hypermobile. Their systems are just trying to figure it out. So I basically had her, I just said, let me just see how you move. Do a lumbar forward bend. Just, and she literally, when I tell you, she couldn't even, she went down like a tree 
Like mm-hmm. no segmental flexion at all. I'm like, mm-hmm. can you do a roll down, drop your chin? And she literally got maybe 20%. Could not even do that at all. I mean, she was so geared into those, into, into the, the paraspinals. Like she literally was like timber, timber falling. Mm-hmm. It was, she could not, she couldn't flex her lumbar spine. All the flexion happening at the hip. Yeah. 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 And very common. Mm-hmm. So in standing, I said, just do, do, do a twist in standing just because she said twisting bothered her. It, I didn't see anything. It wasn't provocative. So I ended up just with that movement alone. I did some compression patterns because I, she, just by, you know, looking at her, you can in her story. She's extremely hypermobile. So I did some posterior compression, like I've talked about in other podcasts, where I put my hands on top of the iliac crest or a little bit lower. And I just do some gentle bilateral posterior compression with my hands. And I had her forward bend. And she was like, oh, that feels much better. I'm like, of course it does. <laughs> then I went to the back. I did, I did anterior. I'm sorry. I went to the front. I did some anterior compression there. She felt okay. No, no pain, but the posterior was better. So I knew she needed some form of stability. So I ended up in sitting, I ended up testing her thoracic rotation because th- once again, that was a, a complaint, uh, mm-hmm. the, the twisting. It was pretty normal. She did not have any symptoms at all, which is not unusual, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I ended up, I didn't do any kind of, actually, I take that back. I had her back in standing. So I'm just going through my notes here. I said, let me just see how you bend, side bend, lumbar, back bend. I mean, when she did a back bend, I don't normally do all those in one, like, I don't test all of those anymore, but she back bend. I mean, she was hinging, hinge, hinge, hinge. I mean, she could have gone to the floor. And then same with side bending. She was hinging at that L1, Mm 2. And some of those were provocative, but the forward bending was the worst. Uh, and her main issue was sitting and also just lying on her back at night. She had a hard time sleeping, to be honest. And she does sleep sometimes lying on her stomach, which is probably not the best, not the best for her. Um, so just based on that, I'll, I'm going to get your thoughts and then I'll go into what I actually found when I got her on the table. So were her extensors overworking? Yes, her QL, mostly her quadratus lumborum, and it's secondarily to her, her extensors. Yeah. Okay. So she wasn't able to shut those off when she forward bent or rolled no, down no. or anything like that. So she was really, so that was probably the reason she was hinging so much is because if you have those muscles over firing, she can't really move her lumbar spine. The question is, why isn't she moving? Did you look at um, uh, combination rotations with her? Did you... I know you'd looked at some twisting and standing and some twisting and sitting. Did you work at any, did you look at a quadrant test? Things yeah, like that? yeah. Or any of those kinds of things to see if the, the combination is what brought her symptoms on. I'm just thinking of the yoga poses, how they'll rotate the body one way and the thorax the they'll other extend. way, you know, right. just the, you know, it's kind of like, because sometimes with hypermobile patients, and I know you've seen this a lot, uh, are people who have a lot of mobility, you have to twist them up a lot further than the normal person mm-hmm. Yeah, in no. order to get their symptoms to like really, really jump on. Yes. No, actually that's a, I know I did not do that, but I, that's actually a great point because I was getting the lumbar forward bend and the back bend side bending yeah. it was provocative. Mm-hmm. I didn't, but that's actually a very good idea because you're right. I, think- I mean, she's super, super, super flexible. Yeah. And she can hinge all the way back. The other thing I think is very interesting is the, she um, likes to stretch the anterior portion of her body. Mm-hmm. Um, they call it a, a hip flexor stretch, but you know we're just stretching the anterior portion of the body, quite frankly, and that feels good to her. Yep. Um, you know, and she's really moving a lot at T1, you know, T12, L1, and all of the sensory input to the front of the hips and the pelvis all come from T12, L1. So yep. you think about the extensor muscles being so tight. Mm -hmm. are are not tight, sorry, um, overworking, over-recruiting, and, you know, the QL being over-recruiting, it makes me also wonder, and rotation brings symptoms on, you know, I'm just kind of wondering what's actually happening with those trunk nerves, if they're, you know, if they're, you know, getting kind of caught up in some neural tension here with this as well, Mm -hmm. with the twisting part, and she like, you know, and that, because that's the input, that's a sensory input to that area, so if that area is getting a lot of input from a lot of movement at T12, L1, that could be one of the things that might be um, making her have that kind of weird feeling in the front. Here's Mm -hmm. the thing that I find most interesting at all about her, is that sitting bothers her. I know, right? Because sitting would put them in a bit of flexion and make them, and actually for what I've seen with a lot of 
people who spend a lot of time in extension, the one thing they like to do is sit and actually draw their knees up. Yes. You know, so but like put their foot on the chair as they're sitting <laughs> for a way of comfort. And, you know, she was getting some, you know, so it'd be interesting to know how she looked on the bike. Yes, I've seen And her. how she looked in sitting because if she didn't allow herself to, sl- you know, maybe she sat around. I don't know. What, what, so, yes. Why don't you talk again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. So she... So when I pressed with that, like she did say lying on her back, bringing your knees to her chest makes her feel better up to a certain point. Right. And when she said sitting, I said, is it sitting, the act of sitting? Mm-hmm. Or is it getting up and down from sitting? And she said, well, both. However, what makes her worse is the movement from a sit to stand, especially off a bike. Ah, right okay. or on, yeah. on a bike on a bike mm-hmm. and also just and i've seen her she's a she's very much shifted to one side i was probably her right side um but it's the transitioning it's it's that the mm-hmm. hypermobility mm-hmm. they can't control the movement if she's sitting for you know 20 minutes or whatever then she gets up that's the main issue for her is she cannot control that movement that makes a lot of sense now and especially yeah. i'm thinking about her on the bike how did she well, you'll get to that, I'm sure. But how did she look on the bike? She, so she basically had, so, so she's small, right? Mm-hmm. So the bike fit, I'm assuming, is pretty good. Uh, you know, we never can assume that because the bike fits sometimes need to be adjusted. But let's assume mm-hmm. that was okay. It's, it's, when you're sitting on a bike, you, because I do, I do a lot of spinning, you, you're, you're more, really much more forward, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but when you're teaching a lot of classes or doing a lot of fitness instruction, taking yoga, especially with her movement pattern, she was not sitting in a lot of flexion. Yeah. Okay. That's on, what I was thinking. Off yeah. those sit bones on the yeah. bike with the hands in front and in, probably in an interior tilt. Yeah. That, you know, Cause I can't see her from behind. I didn't see mm-hmm. her from behind, but that's exactly what she was doing. Yeah. And that would make sense then why that was bothering her. Cause it was feeding into the same, pattern so it may not be that you know it just sounds like she was you know really developing a good uh sensitivity around the you know those segments in her back there and the compression was the compression through her lumbar spine was what was getting her when you took that away by adding some compression into the pelvis down Mm -hmm. into the legs so that she didn't have to work so hard in her lumbar Mm -hmm. spine Mm -hmm. then that kind of actually eased things up for her a little bit so that begins to to come together as a better picture here Yes, yes. And I, and I do think that uh, ultimately with her, it's, you know, it, it, the sleeping also was a bother, a bother mm-hmm. in her, but she sleeps a lot on her stomach, which makes sense. And because mm-hmm. she's really hinging there. So we talked a little bit about sleeping and, and putting pillows and things like that. But when I actually got her on the table, I said, let me just take a look at your back and I'm just going to do a, your basic passive accessory for T-Pro mobility, your pavum. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's super hypermobile. I did that purposely. Uh, she's not really provocative uh, a little bit, but really hypermobile and, you know, L1, L2, if not more so. Bilateral quadratus lumborum, really jacked up. Bilateral psoas, jacked up. I'm like, that's the only thing that's holding you together. That's why you feel better. You feel better short term when someone releases your QL and your psoas, but you're going to resort to the same strategy once yeah. you walk out of the yeah, office. It's not lasting. Mm-hmm. Not lasting. And I said, you can still do that and that'll be great. And, and if you don't, you know, if you take away vacation, you'll be okay. And you don't do the, these movements over and over again. But ultimately, y- you have some form of a, of, a, of a control problem is what I was, was telling her. And I ended up when she had, it was interesting because when I had her sort of do sit to stand in the office, I don't have a spin bike in the office, but when I had her do the sit to stand, putting her arms out, I, I wanted her to hold on to something because you're, you're holding on to the 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 handlebars when you're spinning Mm -hmm. when she so she's pretty much you know click clipped in hands on the bar sit to stand she'd really shift to the right so her upper her rib six seven or her rings as we like to call it with lj and diane rings shifted to the right right so okay i do i i'm very similar on the bike i'm way over on the right i know i need to get back over i'm very aware of that and i think making that clear to her and making her more aware of that when she is on the bike and when she's teaching she can get herself back to the center which has helped her so when you that's interesting some... when did when she stood and you were working with her did she shift off to the right yes 
Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's the same pattern you see onto the bike. Yes. Yes. Okay, and you're, cool. And, yeah. you're cl and you're clipped in. So, and your hands are on the bike. So it's kind of hard for you to compensate. You got to, so, and, and, and because when she was younger, she was so used to disassociating the thoracic spine, right. she shifted right and left. Like, and like crazy. She, mm -hmm. Yes. And she could do that very easily because it's almost like the people who sublux their shoulders as a habit yes you know the ones that we talk about that that's actually a behavioral problem yeah you know oh, for chronic shoulder subluxers you know that yeah. they that it's it's because you know they they start doing it and it becomes this thing that they do all the time and i know in the ortho sports world they call it almost a behavioral problem that's you know to get them to stop it because yeah. it's you know it's not I don't know if there's any research saying it's good for the shoulder or not, but I guess if you keep pulling it out of place all the time, it can't be helpful. Right. So, you know, it kind of makes me kind of think about that as, you know, it's not, I don't think she was doing it on purpose, but she was just doing it because she could so much. That was something yeah. that was yeah. the pattern in her brain. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. this is where I move. I move from here. I was taught to move from here at a young age, doing all the crazy fun dancing I was doing. But now maybe it's not serving me so well on the bike. <laughs> right. And exactly. And that is why I, I think it's so important to hone home the importance of prior injuries or prior. I, mean, I dig deep into like, what did you do as a child? What did you do? You know, mm -hmm. what injuries? That is so important because nine times out of 10, that is relevant to their current situation. Mm -hmm. So, and she didn't volunteer that information until I stood her up. So I was digging into the history but she and but I I wasn't getting that oh I hinge when I had her stand up she's like oh I did this so it, it was like a ringing a, a bell in her head so mm -hmm. you, know, you do the best you can when you try to interview somebody and get, grab information that you think is relevant but that doesn't stop you know after the first visit or even after the initial interview while you're working with them and, and assessing them you could say did you do this or you know it just it, it continues it, it it certainly continues so mm -hmm. so. Based on that information, um, I was like, look, I can release your psoas. I can release your, I'm easy. I can do that. I'm a manual therapist. I can do that all day long. But you need to change your strategy. Ultimately, that's what you need to do. So initially, what I ended up doing was I taped her, of course, because I tend to do that on the first visit. <laughs> um, so What'd you tape? Say again. What'd you tape? I did the posterior compression, the pelvis. Okay. Yep. So I think we've gotten some emails about that tape. I'm, we probably have to put that up on the website, but it, literally, you know, piece of hypofix on one, right below P, right, like literally on PSIS. So I wrap it around, hypofix on one side, hypofix on the other. I put the leuco tape on top, on and then on both sides. So she's. Do you go lateral to medial or medial to lateral? Lateral to medial. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Lateral tomatoes for mm -hmm. the posterior. So she felt pretty good. No problem. And then I didn't see her for two months. Okay. Okay. Because of whatever scheduling or whatever. I mean, I think that people who it's very, it's human nature. The tape felt great. I feel better. You know, that type of thing. I'm going to go about my business. And then she came back two months later and she's like, I felt so much better, but then my schedule got in the way and it's just killing me now. And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. You need to have some consistency here. We need to get you to do something consistently because this is a motor pattern ingrained in your brain and you're not going to, you're not, you know, we need at the beginning, you, we need to do more is more. And then at the end, less is more, especially with people who are hypermobile. They're just going to do, do, do what they know best, which is just sliding back and forth into that pattern or that the, the path that the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I told her to cut back a bit on the yoga the last time I had seen her just because it was just not, I didn't think it was, it was really helping her as much. She did, a, she did go, but not as much, but she did not do any of the twisting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I saw her back in November, which is recent, a couple of weeks ago, that was, that was my second visit for the back. So I didn't see her much for the back. Uh, she basically had, I rechecked everything, lumbar forward bend, back bend, side bend, forward, they were all provocative. Mm -hmm. Okay. And because her back actually was more exacerbated than when I'd seen her two months prior. I ended up doing, I don't know, if, I don't do these that much. I know we, I think I learned these in school years ago, but these sitting stability tests through the arms. Do you do those at all? Flexion extension stability and sitting at all? I, I have not. I, you know, we talked about that a little bit when we talked about the um, um, lady with the shoulder pain because yep. she was 
unable to hold her arm out in front of her and hold. Um, but I have not really done a lot of that in sitting. I've done it somewhat, you know, in standing a little bit, um, having them shift their weight to find a, you know, kind of a point to where they can hold a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. But I also tend to use, um, uh, you know, a pelvic floor, you know, activation with a with the stability stuff because if they can activate their pelvic floor in different positions and that kind of helps them know mm, that i'm probably pulling in right. a little bit better with some better recruitment here um right. but i there's nothing wrong with the arms at all and the legs and in fact that fits in with um an article by kohler in 2012 and josbt and looking at the diaphragm and what happens to the diaphragm in patients with back pain and patients without you know, clients mm -hmm. with back pain and clients without and the recruitment pattern change in the diaphragm. And, mm -hmm. you know, they look at the arm, you know, against, you know, resistance and leg against resistance. Of course, they're in supine instead of standing or sitting. But, the, you know, that the, the idea behind it, I think, remains the same, which is great because it brings up the point that maybe her diaphragm is over recruiting in an effort to help her because she's moved so much at T12 L1, mm -hmm. which is where the diaphragm is. And mm -hmm. maybe that, you know, they, you know, the diaphragm and some of the back extensor muscles are really being over recruited because she's just not getting the oomph from, yes. you know, the, the deeper core up, you know, segmental motor control as we mm -hmm. were talking about. And so in the face of that, they're going to over recruit quadratus and, and, and the diaphragm feeds right into the quadratus and those, yeah. and yep. those muscles there in the posterior abdominal wall. So yeah, that, no, I think that that, you know, bringing that up makes that kind of like, hmm, maybe I need to rethink that just a little bit in the clinic myself as a way to kind of see, you know, people's buckle points because right. it certainly fits with the, the literature and the research. So that's a great point. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I normally don't, I don't do those that much, but I had mm -hmm. her, I basically had her in sitting. I just, you know, had my, you know, one hand, she, she basically had her, both of her arms out at 90 degrees. I ended mm -hmm. up pushing down on them with my other hand, with mm -hmm. one hand, and, and my mm -hmm. hand was just monitoring her lumbar spine. So she was resisting into extension, and that really flared, that like really mm -hmm. provoked her symptoms. So of course it did, you know, and then right. I went the other way. It went, went into her pattern. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then I went the other way where she was stabilizing into flexion, and she was fine. I'm like, of course. That, that makes sense. You know, and that, yeah, because then she was able to recruit her abdominal wall easier. Exactly. Right? And exactly. probably lats, yep. you know, when you're doing that coming down part. So, you know, you get the posterior lats, the anterior abdominal wall, and or, you know, the lateral abdominal wall coming in. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that is probably something that's very important because then you're bringing in some tension and integrity into the thoracolumbar fascia, mm -hmm. which is going to help pull her out of extension or pull her out of her pattern of extension because that thoracolumbar fascia is going to pull back on the spinous processes. Yep. So I love it. I'm, I'm, yep. I'm putting this back into my thing. <laughs> I can't wait. So I've got a couple I, of people I'm going to see tomorrow that is like, we're doing this right off the bat. I know. I kind of do it, but I haven't really done it intentionally as a, t I love it. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. And it was interesting because I, so, so I said, well, now we know what takes your symptoms away. And she's like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, she's like, well, I was thinking of doing Pilates. I'm like, well, let's just hold off for now and just, you know, so then I ended up having her get on her hands and knees. It's not a test I do often, but having come back from Shirley Sorman's course back in October, they do, they, they, what's one of their sort of their standard tests is on all fours. I yeah. once again, I don't do it often, but I basically, I said, look, get on your hands and knees just sort of rock back, obviously no flexion. I said, let's start here. Do a posterior pelvic tilt. Just, just really try to round your lumbar spine on all fours and just mm -hmm. let's try and sit back here, okay? Zero. I mean, I got her like yeah. halfway. Yeah. Nothing, nothing. Mm -hmm. She couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. She couldn't do it. So I said, okay, let's start here. Let's just go into neutral, go into a little bit of a posterior tilt and see if you can go down. So I got her a little bit more. So when she goes into that full sort of, thoracolumbar flexion on all fours, I was getting nowhere. Right. Okay. Right. So I said, try an extension, which I knew she would do no problem, which she did. So I mean, really arching her back. And then mm -hmm. so I said, let's go to neutral, do a little bit of a posterior tilt, recruit your abdominal wall and see if you can go down. And so she went down partly. I'm like, stop there, go back. So mm -hmm. actually I started doing a little bit of that with her. Any movement that I gave her, I said, you need to start with a bit of a posterior tilt or you, you, anyhow, any way, or sh way, shape or form, you can recruit your pelvic floor, or your lower abdominals. You need to start there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I felt that she just was not able to, to recruit them. So I said, go, let's go to standing. So I had, I said, do a little bit of a posterior tilt and stand just a little and bend forward. She couldn't even drop her head. 
That is mm -hmm. how she could not, she was so fixed in that extensor pattern. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is, what do you think of that? I mean, I, I said to her, I said, look, let's start, let's start from below. Let's do a little bit of a posterior tilt. Let's get you out of that, that, that lardosis. For her, a posterior tilt was probably neutral <laughs> for most people, right? Mm -hmm. And recruit your abdominal wall. Let's do, let's do a slow forward bend to see if you can actually turn those lumbar extensors off, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, do you have any thoughts on that, or should I continue? Yeah, no, no. The, the, you know, to me, this is typical short girl syndrome. Yeah. Um, you know, they're going to stand and, and bring their head up and their thorax up because they're living in, a, in an average world, and they're not average. They're short. And so their whole life has been, you know, everything is up above where they can I see. I love it. And short so girl everything, syndrome. I know, but it, but it just. I love knows, it. But it's true. Well, see, I'm a short girl. So, <laughs> and I'll tell my husband, you know, that this doesn't, if it's above this shelf, it doesn't exist for me. I don't see it. You know, I just, <laughs> but I mean, you spend your whole life with your head up in the air, you know, looking up and, and, you know, the whole posture follows that. Totally. And so not only with dance, you know, so she learned to move where she could and dance, but you know, she had this, you know, so this is a, this is a big one to change for her and to, you know, because especially if it makes her feel better. Yeah. So the idea yeah. here is that her brain has set up these patterns because it's the way she can move through her, her life. Mm -hmm. But can we change it enough so that she has enough variance so that she has some movement variability in there to get her out of the sensitized system or, or yeah. segments or whatever may be going on there. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's very interesting when you get people, uh, you can actually, if you have people who can't get on their hands and knees for whatever reason, you can do it leaning over a, a, a countertop as well. Yeah. Yeah. Great idea. And, you know, kind of, it's just a matter of, you know, giving them two other fixed points. So either their knees in their hands or their feet in their hands to be able to kind of start to like try to gain some control through the pelvis and the lumbar spine, mm -hmm. you know, that maybe they can't do on two fixed points of their feet. Mm -hmm. You know, so which is I, I I know that's why the Sarman group kind of starts that way because it gives them other points, you know, to to give stability so that they can try to get mobility where they don't have it, right. um, you know, and and somebody like this who standing on her feet is going to fall into that pattern. It's going to be very difficult for her to break out of it. Mm -hmm. So I love the fact that you got her on her hands and knees or just some other way because one of the things you want to feed into her too is the bike. So here's the perfect person to get on hands and knees because if she can start controlling this on hands and knees or feet and hands whichever way because that's what the bike would be right mm, yeah then you can yes. it's going to translate over into her spinning and that's mm -hmm. what that's where you're headed because that's what you want she wants to be able to teach spinning and not mm -hmm. hurt she wants to be able to go to yoga and not hurt so yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah no no I, yeah, I, ne I never thought of the analogy with on your hands and knees and spinning but of course that makes complete sense you're just mirroring the image onto the mm -hmm. a, yeah Exactly. That's awesome. Uh, so basically what I, I ended up do, doing a lot of that with her, the first visit on the hands and knees. And I, I said, let me try the tape again. The posterior compression didn't work as well this time. So I took it off immediately. Okay. So what I ended, cause she'd respond well to taping and, and I wasn't going to see her for a couple of weeks because of the, uh, my travel schedule. So I said, let me just put some just from both of your proprioceptive cueing, just a piece on bilaterally, uh, di so diagonally around, like around like the 12th rib, 11, you know, 10th mm -hmm. rib, going up the same thing on the right, same thing on the left, hypofix the Luca tape, almost like an upside down V on her back, right? Mm -hmm. Just for some stability, I had a crossed midline, so it stabilized that quote unquote stabilized that that area, which was highly, you know, hypermobile. It was more, I, I, I'm like, she's like, are, are you like, pre pre like preventing me from moving there? I'm like, theoretically, yes, but I'm just trying to give your nervous system another option to move. And I love that. I tell that to my patients all the time because I don't want her to get fixed on, oh, my hypermobile segment is not going right, to, you know, right. that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So I did that on, I did that. And then we, I, she went away and then I just saw her this past week. So I haven't seen her a lot. Mm -hmm. And she came in, she's the taping was amazing. I said, well, it gave you some input. Yeah. She said her uh, transition on the bike was a lot better. Her, her sleeping was much better, but still an issue. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, well, I expected, I don't expect to get you miraculously better, you know, since you've had this symptom for so long in one visit, but it was, it was really the, it was really the sleeping that had, was bothering her at, at this point. And, mm -hmm. but I know that she needs a program, uh, which is what I want to talk about 
of some some basic movement exercises to really get her into that flexion pattern. So mm -hmm. what I did, I, I treated her similarly, and then I actually wanted to get her to, to start to do some things on some of the Pilates equipment. I gave her, so this is what I want to just talk about briefly. Uh, she obviously does better with the posterior pelvic tilt and having some weight in front of her to recruit her abdominal mm -hmm. wall. So I said, since you know, you're sitting, you're squatting, I gave her some squats. I said, you need to have some weight in front of you. Not one pound, not mm -hmm. two pound, not three pound. You need to have some weight that's going to cause this feed forward mechanism in your brain to turn on your abdominal wall. Yeah. So I said, I would even go up to eight to 10. But so we started with four, you know, and she's like, oh, I actually feel my abdominals. I'm like, that's what I want. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want a one pound weight in your hand. Mm -hmm. People who are hypermobile do better with resistance. Yeah. So I had her start off with a little bit of a posterior tilt, put the weight in front of her. I had her go up and down squat on and off a BOSU ball, mm -hmm. basically. And I taped her as well, the same tape in the, in the upside down V in the thorax. I have a Pilates, a piece of equipment on the Pilates. I had her do, it's called a Wonder Box. I don't know if you, you know the mm -hmm. box with the springs. I had her basically put both of her feet on the moving part of that box to mm -hmm. do like, like a pike, almost like a yeah. pike to recruit yeah. her abdominals. So I had her do two springs and one spring. And she is interesting. She actually was pretty okay with that, which was shocking to me because I didn't think she'd be able to do that. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what, what is she using here? She's using, obviously using her abdominals. But she said that after, because I said, let's just do a few. You know, so maybe it's the endurance of the abdominal wall. She did about 10 and she's like, oh, I really feel that. I'm like, okay, <laughs> because I thought she'd have a lot of problems with that, but she did it. It's interesting because a lot yeah. of times we think that it may be a strength or force production problem because they haven't used it in a while. And simply when you get people into, a, a, you know, just a different movement pattern that's going to require muscles to switch on, once they get the hang of it, they can do it. You know, it's a, it, this is just a coordination problem that, you know, those muscles were never called into play yeah. in that way. And you put her in a position where they actually had to work and she could do it, which is really cool because then you can convince them, look, it's not a strength problem. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, this is just, this is where the postural variability will really help you um, mm -hmm. because you can feel that in different positions, you can get different muscles to turn on and work for you. So we, we don't want to keep you in the same, you know, dominant pattern that you're in all the time. We want to give you that variability. So, and again, here, Erica, I love what you're doing because you had her hands on the box and her feet on the springs. Yeah. And again, that's a variation of that kind of pitch forward, pro, you know, mm -hmm. posture on the yep. bike. Yeah. Um, which is like very cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but, I, but it is, it's really interesting to just kind of give people the, you know, like, let's just see what happens with this and see what you can do. People can do so much more than we think they can. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Absolutely. And I think that that's it, I, when I was picking the box, I know she doesn't have access to that, but I was like, let me just try that. But it's true. It's the issue short of trauma, surgery, or, you know, falling. It's something these people do all day long. And she does, she does, she spins, she teaches a lot, mm -hmm. you know, hands on the bike, feet clipped in. If you can reproduce that movement pattern outside that, that studio and start moving in and out of different postures, mimicking that fortune, that four point kneel that, you know, I, I think for her was very helpful. And I got her on the Cadillac doing some, you know, just some, some very interesting. I had her on the Cadillac with the, the bar, right. doing some seated mm -hmm. push downs. Uh -huh. And when her hamstrings were on stretch, like she couldn't really sit, sit. She couldn't really sit with her, with her legs straight no. without going into that. You know, she, she couldn't do it. She couldn't even right. flex. So mm -hmm. I just had her bend her knees a little bit and I had her push down. And of course, immediately she felt it in her back. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so did you did try some... putting did you try putting like uh, a couple of folded blankets up under her pelvis to get her higher no, no i think that's yeah, a great it, idea yeah because it may be that the hamstrings were over recruiting and pulling her and that's why it didn't feel good yeah you know yeah, but that's... i like what you were trying to do because again you were trying to bring in the flexion of the arms because i was going to suggest what was a roll down going to look like with her you know holding the bar in the springs would she be able to do it or did she have the range of motion yet to... you know it's funny because she said to me because she's done done pilates before she's like are we going to do roll downs? I'm like, not today. And I, it's funny you mentioned that because I said to myself, I would have liked to have seen that after I, when I was writing the note up, but I'll see, I'll see him seeing her in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll do that. My guess is she probably won't be able to do it. 
No, but maybe with her knee bent, she could. She could for sure. Mm -hmm. So yeah. then I had her. Then I had her do some just like little leg springs. Everything basically just trying to get a posterior tilt. And then I just had her do some leg springs. You know, lying supine on the plinth uh -huh. on the Cadillac with the things wrapped, the straps wrapped around her ankles. Just doing easy pushing. You know, I just wanted to see if she could do it. She had no problem with that at all. And so, so, so that's where I ended it. Okay. And, but be, since she needs so much of this sort of flexion based stabilization, I thought from a progression and I'll, I'll, I'll say, tell you what I would do. Maybe I would hear your thoughts and we can end it there. But I think that I would love to put her in a, like a full kneel, half kneel, doing some, some, something with a weight in front of her or doing some PNF, easy sort of uh, chop patterns mm -hmm. at some point to get to really to get a recruiter abdominal to sort of bring her from half kneel, kneel. Uh, I almost would love to do, have her do like rolling patterns um, on the floor and then start to, to, to progress her to more, uh, you know, mimicking things with the bike, doing some, some squats with more weight in front. I don't know how I could progress anything on the box at this point because the, the springs were just at a very difficult level to begin with. I can do more endurance. But what are your thoughts on just people like that? Because it's obvious – it's obvious what her issues are. She cannot flex. She needs to recruit her abdominal wall. She's short. She's a spin instructor. In terms of an exercise progression, what, what would you do in a situation like that? So some of the other things that you can do to, to really kind of progress her up from uh, um, bilateral knees to actually standing as, as some of the things that I do is because in people, we have talk about this all the time and it's like they need to appropriately learn how to use the flexion power pattern better so I'll have them on hands and knees with um, some sort of resistance band around their thighs so that it's pulling from behind so that they have to actually pull forward with their you know they have to bring their knee closer to their chest you know ah, so got we're, it. we're working that way and or I'll have their they have the therabands around their arms coming back so that they have to pull back so we get some latissimus activity along with it I love it. Um, sometimes you can just have them on their hands and knees with their hands on the bed and just have them push, you know, push towards their knees, you know, um, and that can bring that stuff on and begin to give them something to automate. I always add exhale with it because with flexion, exhale goes really well. And or with her as a fitness instructor, I would have her talk because she needs mm -hmm. to be able to talk and do this stuff. Yeah. And so she's got to train exhale for all of that. And, you know, she may, you know, it's going to only help her. Mm -hmm. um, being able to yell over the, the, you know, the, the spend mic, you know, if she's got good vocal control with exhale mm -hmm. and those patterns so that it kind of feeds into that thing that she needs to do. But I like doing stuff like that. And then I'll put the, 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 the resistance band, you know, around the pelvis and have them walk. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, and pull and so that they're pulling into the, you know, they, and with her, you might even find that, you know, putting it at the level of her diaphragm or around her midsection, you know, there may be another point for her that's a little bit better, but she did so well at the pelvis. Yeah. But that's kind of a great thing. And people go, well, you're just feeding into, the, you know, tight hip flexors. And it's like, no, I'm, I'm, because when they're walking, one has to recruit differently than the other. Right. And so what I'm trying to do is load eccentric hip flexion mm -hmm. or load eccentric psoas on the side where the leg is straight Yep. as they're working. So what I'm doing is actually trying to get the pelvic halves to kind of start working reciprocally and not together. Right. You know, so because the when they're in extension pattern, they just pull together. They don't pull, you know, so that's why I have them do walking or step ups. It's interesting you say that because mm -hmm. when I first evaluated her, I applied the bilateral anterior and the bilateral post posterior compressions. The best was the bilateral posterior and the second best was bilateral anterior. When I did the oblique compressions, asymmetrical compressions, they made her worse. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's what she needs to train. Yeah. And so you can do that with step ups. You can do it and it doesn't have to be high step ups. You know, she yeah. can st be a low step up with the resistant band around her with the force, you know, pulling from behind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she can work on step up, step down, step up, step down. You know, she can work on taking steps. There's a lot yeah. of fun things she can do with that. Plus it'll help make her stay um, on one side versus the other. It'll help her kind of move off of what you, you said she was right. Yeah. Right. Shifted to the right. Yes. So yeah. It, you know, can help bring that in. 
And, you know, you can, so that, that works. You know, the other thing, if she's a real high level person, I would have to wait until she was like really super good at being able to really get, you know, like in a prone plank type position and really control mm -hmm. that without using her extensors. Yeah. It's going to be a challenge for her. But um, if she ever could do it, you could put her legs, you know, into uh, the resistance band or something like a TRX and have her just bring one knee up to the chest and the other knee up to the chest, one of the, mm. you know. Um, but that, that would that's really super high level. Maybe it, with the knees bent again, that's why I like doing that, you know, um, in hands and knees mm -hmm, because yeah. they can slide their knee forward and then they can actually actively pull their knee forward and so then they can, you know, it just feeds yeah. into that reciprocal kind of movement that you're looking for there. And that makes sense with the bike because the bike is, bike is reciprocal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the band would be around the thighs and, uh -huh. and then you could also around the arms. One, one band, correct? Uh, well, you could do two bands. I usually do two, one on yeah. each leg. Was I was going to say because yeah. that the, the, yeah, or one on each arm. Right. You know, I just because yeah. I like the body that you know. If we're going after segmental, you know, yeah. uh, um, motor control and and motor recruitment, mm -hmm. the less symmetrical I can be with them, the better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so if they have to deal with their own bands on each leg, then that makes them have to recruit different than if they've got yeah. one around. One on one, yeah. Then the stronger leg can still kind of win. Yeah, and then with the <laughs> band around, exactly. <laughs> or, the, or, the, or the more coordinated or whatever side, the yeah. pattern can kind of still win in that yeah. position. You know, that's why when you put her on the Cadillac with the separate leg springs, they have to cope with it differently. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and it, because they don't have the other, you know, they don't have the, the pattern to, 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 they can't go into their pattern, you yeah. know, as a recruitment device anymore. Yeah. When you have their legs separated on those springs, they have to cope with it differently. Yeah. It's interesting. So when she, when you put the band around the pelvis, when she's walking one, same, same, obviously one band, but then it, but it's yeah. going to cause her to eccentrically load those hip flexors. So those are all great ideas. And I think it goes back to just at the beginning of the assessment, you know, the asymmetrical stuff made it worse. So she yeah. needs to really train that. Um, and it, obviously, you know, people like her, it, it, hypermobility and, and control, they take, it takes, it, it doesn't happen overnight. No. These people are so used to, and I'm a hypermobile myself, we're so used to doing things quickly and easily and let's do it until like we run out of options. And her buckle point, I think she was made aware of her buckle point, quote unquote, mm -hmm. right? Because now she's like, oh. So I had her also, I said, when you're on the bike, just just because there's a weight section in the class, I said, just push your hands lightly down on the handlebars to recruit your lower abdominals. Just while you're spinning, just do a gentle push down, right? Mm -hmm. Just to get her more aware of that. Uh, as well while she's and again that starts recruiting lats which is going yes. to help the tensor fascia uh um, yep. you know the, i'm sorry the thoracolumbar the fascia, lumbar fascia to have a little bit of tension through it to help you know to passively yep. could you know because it, it's a passive restraint system it just is going to help passively control that lumbar spine a bit yep yeah just totally. won't be hanging in lordosis if especially if she's sensitive in that in that position yeah uh totally so that's awesome. So I'm actually cool. going to be seeing her now once a week. Um, so I will report back or uh, because this is, this is a common scenario. And I think these people get lost in our system. And I think that we need to, uh, as a profession, really need to stick with this, this population. So mm -hmm. um, it's great. Great suggestions. Awesome. Thank you, Susan. Yep. Cool. Lots of fun. Lots of fun, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have our website, tough2treat.com. We have a couple of PDFs on there for you guys who are not um, subscribers onto our list. If you sign up uh, onto the list, you'll automatically get the PDF. I have a ch uh, chapter for my book and Susan has some awesome things regarding sleeping and, and breathing and things like that. So tough to treat.com. And if you have not left us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify, please do so. We would really appreciate it. We're trying to get this podcast up into the top 10 would be in health and medicine. It'd be awesome if you could help us do that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.